If it's Tuesday, another batch of classified documents is discovered, this time at the home of former Vice President Mike Pence. What we know and don't know amid the growing legal and political fallout from these revelations. Plus, a gunman kills at least seven people outside of San Francisco two days after 11 were shot dead in Monterey Park, California. Two very different incidents, but sadly part of the same tragic story of gun violence in America. And a potentially major escalation as NBC News has learned that the U.S. has decided to send Abrams tanks to Ukraine. My interview with a top White House national security official ahead. Welcome to Meet the Press Now. I'm Kristen Welker on a very busy afternoon in Washington. The president is huddling with Democratic leadership at the White House right now for the first time in this new session of Congress. And as the president faces criticism from both inside and outside of his party over his handling of classified information, news broke this afternoon that another batch of classified material had been found, this time at former Vice President Mike Pence's Indiana home. According to correspondence obtained by NBC News between Pence's legal team and the National Archives, a small number of documents was discovered last week. Former Vice President Mike Pence's team is asserting that he had no knowledge of those documents and is pledging full cooperation. This new discovery comes despite Pence flatly denying taking classified documents from the White House during an ABC News interview in November. Did you take any classified documents with you from the White House? Uh, I, I did not. Um, Do you see any reason for anyone to take classified documents with them leaving the White House? Well, there'd be no reason to have classified documents, particularly if they were in an unprotected area. A few days after that interview, Pence was also pressed by Chuck on Meet the Press about former President Trump's handling of classified material. I'm not hesitated to criticize the president when I think he was wrong. And... Uh, and clearly possessing cl classified documents in an unprotected area is not proper. House Oversight Committee Chairman James Comer, a Republican, lauded Pence's, quote, transparency, seizing on the opportunity to differentiate Pence's handling of documents from President Biden's, who has in turn sought to separate himself from former President Trump's mishandling of classified material and potential obstruction of justice. This afternoon, Attorney General Merrick Garland spoke to reporters at an event at the Justice Department, but he would not answer questions about his agency's involvement in the matter tied to Pence, nor whether he'd consider a third special counsel to investigate. It leaves Washington now facing a web of political and legal messes of varying proportions, all involving classified documents over multiple administrations. Joining me now to discuss this, NBC's Monica Alba is outside the White House, and NBC's Garrett Hake is on Capitol Hill. Monica, I want to start with you. What is the very latest that we know about this discovery at former Vice President Pence's Indiana home? Well, it's notable here, Kristen, that what prompted this review was the fact that President Biden's own Wilmington residence was searched. And that is when former Vice President Pence asked his lawyers to do a more thorough review and say, hey, we should look within our own home. Is there potentially something here for my time as vice president that we should look over? And that's when they did discover what they're calling a small number of documents that had classification markings. Now, we don't know exactly what small number means. That's that's a phrase that's been thrown around in discussing President Biden's own discoveries here. We don't exactly know how many pages, what kind of information, what level of classification. We still don't know that. And that is something now that is in the hands, we understand, of the National Archives. So the former vice president's lawyers, when they discovered this, they let authorities know. And then the Department of Justice actually went to his home in Indiana. They recovered the documents themselves after they had been placed in a locked safe. And then now we're learning a little bit more about what his attorneys are saying about this. And they maintain that the former vice president was unaware that they were there. As you saw in that interview you played in your introduction, that was certainly what he told the media at the time. But this is something, of course, that did come to light given we saw it's not just the former vice president here, the current sitting president, but also the former president, of course, who was along with Mike Pence in office, Donald Trump and his handling of the classified records. Of 
very different case because that involved an FBI seizure of all of this classified material that the former president wouldn't give back when the National Archives had asked for it. So I think what you're seeing here is the president's silence when it comes to this. He ignored shouted questions, tells you a lot about how this White House may be responding, which is they feel it's totally okay for that to change the conversation, for there to be a focus on another former executive who was in possession of these documents to take away from their own complete, you know, potential mishandling here of the documents that were found at both the president's former office and within his home, Kristen. There's no doubt that this headline could distract from all of the focus that has been on the current commander in chief in this regard, Monica, really important point. I do wanna ask you uh, before we get to Garrett on Capitol Hill about this critical meeting that is underway right now, the president meeting with Democratic leader, Senator Schumer, Congressman Jeffries. What's on the agenda, Monica? A lot. And this was a meeting that was set a couple of days ago. This predated a lot of this, but they are uh, really tackling a lot of very thorny issues here. Probably at the top of the list, what's going to happen with the debt ceiling. The president has said that there is no room for negotiation here, whereas House Republicans have said they don't want to raise it without promises of future spending cuts. So that's a major topic on the agenda. And then I think you saw the president there talking about his heart being heavy today with the news out of California. Mm both of those horrendous mass shootings and he did say he would like to see an assault weapons ban that's something he has wanted for some time so there's going to be discussion about that as well as what else might be on the legislative agenda coming up in the year ahead Kristen, yeah, I, I think you touched on all of the critical points Garrett let me go to you this is uh, the first time that all of Congress is back uh, since we learned of this latest batch of classified documents found at President Biden's home and now this bombshell today classified documents found at former Vice President Pence's Indiana home what's the reaction been on Capitol Hill some of it's been pretty heated yeah, talking to senators, I think there's a transition here from this being a political problem from one party to the, or the other to more of a national security problem with what appears to be, if you want to be generous, at the very least, an outbreak of pure sloppiness when it comes to how classified documents are handled within the executive branch. Lindsey Graham, who's been a critic of uh, President Biden at times, but also has known him for a very long time, uh, was asked about the latest round of uh, classified document gate after the Pence news broke today. And had this to say, which I think is instructive. Okay, so let's find out how that happened. Uh, you got Trump, you got Pence, you got Biden. The only thing I think you'll find at my house is a bunch of Chick-fil-A bags on the floor. Uh, the bottom line is I don't, I don't know how this happened. We need to get to the bottom of it. And so what became a political problem, um, you know, for Republicans is now a national security problem for the country. The bottom line, Kristen, is lawmakers want answers, and so far they've gotten none. I talked to Marco Rubio and Mark Warner, the top uh, Republican and Democrat on the Senate Intel Committee uh, about an hour and a half ago, and basically everything they know about these documents is from media reports. They have not been briefed by the Intel Committee. They've not been briefed by Justice and the special counsels who are investigating the two presidents' cases of, uh, of document disclosures, and they want answers. And I think the one other thing I'd add, Kristen, is when it comes to uh, foreign Former Vice President Mike Pence, he appears to be the only one of those three men who's had something of a media strategy around how these disclosures have become public. You saw it this afternoon with news breaking almost simultaneously to multiple different outlets and a news release coming out from James Comer's office, the chairman of the House Oversight Committee, saying that they were informed by uh, former Vice President Pence about these documents at about the same time and kind of getting some air cover from Comer by, about Pence, saying that Pence appeared to be cooperating and doing this the right way. Uh, the most uh, sort of intentional rollout of this information from anybody we've seen embroiled in this kind of messiness so far. Yeah, it's a good point you bring up, Garrett, because of course so much of the criticism revolving around the White House has been uh, its lack of transparency, particularly in the uh, initial phases of this. Let me ask you very quickly, Garrett, before I let you go, Monica laid out the Democratic priorities, their agenda. What are Republicans looking at what are their priorities? Well, look, it's going to be mostly in the oversight realm. I think House Republicans are learning the hard way that passing any legislation, including messaging bills, is going to be challenging. They are struggling even today to determine if they have the votes to kick Ilhan Omar off the Foreign Affairs Committee, something that you heard a lot of House Republicans essentially running on in the 2022 elections. With their majority so narrow, they've got now Greg Stubbe, who was injured, falling off his roof last week out for a couple of weeks. They are going to be in a situation much like House Democrats were in 
last cycle where just getting any basic legislation passed will be hard. Look to the committees for the work they intend to be doing. All right. Great way to start us off. Monica and Garrett, thank you. Great to see both of you. And joining me now is Nebraska Republican Congressman Don Bacon. Congressman Bacon, thank you so much for joining me this afternoon. Really appreciate it. Thanks, Krista. It's great to be on Meet the Press. Let me start off by asking you about the breaking news of the day. You just heard Monica and Garrett talking about this. What is your reaction to the revelations that classified documents were found at the home of former Vice President Mike Pence? Well, we have an epidemic of senior leaders taking classified home, and we have to say categorically, whether it's Republican or Democrat, it's all wrong. And I do appreciate the fact that Mike Pence leaned into it, was false right away, uh, but it's still, we, we have a problem when we have a president, a vice president who's now president, and a vice president having classified in their homes. I, I worked with classified top secret information since 1985, and I can guarantee you I do not have any classified in our home, but it just shows carelessness, negligence, and I think Americans should be mad. Yeah, well, your, your colleague, Congressman Mike Waltz, said today, the system is broken. Would you go so far as to say the system is broken when it comes to handling classified material? Not if you follow the rules. I mean, I, I get top secret information here. You go into a vault. Everything's numbered. You can't take anything out. I have to take my both my cell phones, put them in a safe, and my GPS watch, put it in a safe. And everything's tightly controlled. And even in a broader briefing, Everything's numbered, and you're not allowed to take information out. So it seems to me that this classified information, at least when it's in the Senate, it would have to be very willful to get that information out uh, where in an area that should not be. Now, granted, the president and vice presidents, they probably get more classified information in their offices uh, than a senator or a, a congressman. But this is negligence at, at a minimum or carelessness. And in some cases, it may have been staffs doing it. That's why it's got to be researched and investigated. But if you follow the rules, there should be no problem. Congressman, I want to follow up with you. You say researched and investigated. Given that, do you think that Merrick Garland should appoint a third special counsel to look into how classified material wound up at the Indiana home of former Vice President Mike Pence? I think Americans want fairness here. You treat one like you treat the other. That's why Joe Biden now has a special counsel. And, and I think we're going to have another one here for uh, Vice Pres President Pence. Okay, so, that, so that's a yes. You would support yes. a third special counsel. Okay, and just very quickly before we move on to uh, some other policy questions, do you want to see the House Oversight Committee investigate President Biden's handling of classified material and former President Trump and now former Vice President Pence? I think you have to be fair about it and look at each one you, to pick out your political adversary and, and not include those on your in your party. It's not right. I think Americans want fair, objective responses here. Uh, this hyper-partisanship point your finger at the other guy, it's not going to work here because we have three cases with di people from different parties here and you got to treat them the same. You got to treat them fairly. Okay. Let's move on to one of the biggest issues facing all of Washington, the debt ceiling. We've seen battles around the debt ceiling before, Congressman, but some people are saying this time it feels different. Can you take us inside some of the conversations? How much urgency is there among Republicans to get this done, to make sure that the nation doesn't default? And do you think this time could be different? Could we, go, we be going over the cliff? Well, we should have a sense of urgency to find a middle ground. Some folks in my party want the moon, I call it, and they're not, they're not going to get it. But the, at the same time, President Biden has said he refuses to negotiate. That is not right either. You know, we have a bicameral, how, or, you know, with the House in, in our control, the Senate and the Democrat control. The president controls, obviously, uh, the presidency with the, as, as a Democrat. But to refuse to negotiate is not the right answer. But on our party, we can't demand a balanced budget in so many years either. That's going to take teamwork working with the Democrats on this to, to get right. So I think there's some middle ground here. I've proposed trying to keep spending within inflation. Uh, we need a commission to look at mandatory spending. And those are the things that I think we should be working towards. Well, and let me just play something that Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer said. I want to get your reaction on the other side. I say to my Republican colleagues, if you want to talk about deep cuts, then you have an obligation, an obligation to show the American people precisely what kind of cuts are you talking about. If you're serious about spending cuts, show us the math. Show us why you think it is worth risking a global financial crisis just to pass an extremist agenda. 
So what cuts, Congressman, would you be willing to support? And can you be specific? Would you support cuts to Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security? No, I wouldn't support cuts to the mandatory spending. That's why I suggest we have a commission, Republicans and Democrats, to work together to figure out how do you save both of these programs? Because if we do nothing, they're going to go insolvent at different times. I mean, Medicare in about four years, Social Security about 2035. We've got to work together to solve that. can't be Republican-only or Democrat-only solutions. I propose keeping spending under inflation in the discretionary funding. I think most Americans would probably agree to that, and that that would be a sensible way forward uh, to get an agreement on raising the uh, debt ceiling. I want to ask you about uh, a move by Speaker McCarthy, who announced members for the Rules Committee yesterday, and it does include some of the lawmakers who opposed his leadership position. What do you make of that? Does that undercut his strength as House Speaker? You know, it may, but I, I really trust Chairman Tom Cole. I will tell you, you got to get Tom Cole on your show because he's one of the best senior leaders we have in our party. He's level-headed. He's comfortable with what we have. I think he, we, there's a 9 to 4 GOP to Democrat ratio when it comes to the Rules Committee. So it's been that way for a long time. And I think there's enough there to that we'll, we'll be able to function well. And if Tom Cole's comfortable, Don Bacon's comfortable. <laughs> well, let me ask you, you say you'll be able to function well. But something that I heard talking to folks on the Hill over the weekend is how can House Speaker McCarthy go in and negotiate a deal with President Biden on the debt ceiling, for example, uh, given that he wouldn't necessarily be able to guarantee the support of all of these people? Does that not undercut his strength and his leverage in those negotiations? If we get a deal like I was talking about, keeping spending under inflation or something comparable, you may lose some of the Republican votes, but you'll get the majority. And you'll get the majority of the Democrats if the President Biden and the Democrat negotiators would agree to it. I think we could get 218 votes if there's a reasonable middle ground sought, but you're not going to get Republican votes when the President says he will not negotiate. And I know we're not going to get Democrat votes in the Senate or the President's support if you try to demand the moon and try to do a balanced budget or cutting mandatory spending without Democrat support. So yeah. I, I just think that there, we got to meet and do some reasonable discussions here. And, but we also have to have a committee or commission of Republicans and Democrats, Democrats working together on shoring up Social Security and Medicare. It can't be either party demanding it. It's going to have to be a bipartisan solution to work. Congressman, just two more. We're almost out of time, but I know you're going to want to talk about both of them. Leader Scalise uh, said your conference would have immigration bills brought to the floor um, and that that would be a top priority. That has not happened yet. What's the holdup? And I know you're you want to see regular order for Chip Roy's bill. Right. You know, part of the negotiations we had with the 20 and really the six when we were doing the speaker's votes is they wanted regular order to things come out of committee, except for they wanted selected bills of their own to not do that and to put them right on the floor. Well, as one of the leaders on the Main Street Republicans, and I'm not the chair anymore, but I, you know, I started it uh, two years ago, I came and said, no, every bill is going to have to go through committee. And that's how you make a bill better. You can round out the rough spots. And I think for the Chip Roy's bill or the, immigrant, the border security bill, there needs to be some discussions on what we're doing with uh, you know, folks that are coming here fleeing you know, a bad government or fleeing torture or murder, whatever it may be, that there has to be an avenue for that. You just can't but, shut that Congressman, off. Congressman, very quickly, this has been one of the top issues for Republicans. What's the holdup? Why haven't we seen any movement on this? Well, it should be put in committee and treated like every other bill. And I believe the Homeland Security will take this border security bill and make it better. Yeah. That's what I want. All right. Let me ask you finally about Ukraine. NBC News reporting that the United States has decided to send a significant number of Abrams tanks to Ukraine. Can you confirm that? What are you hearing? And what's your reaction to that announcement? Is that the right I've thing? Only heard it, I've only heard it through the news, but I absolutely agree. It's the right thing to do. If by sending some Abrams tanks to Ukraine, which, by the way, is the best tank in the world, and people can learn to operate it pretty quickly from the Army, the soldiers I've worked with, that's what they tell me. But this will free up Germany and other countries sending the, the Leopard tanks, for example, to Ukraine. And that's what they really need. They need about 300 tanks total to stave off a Russian uh, offensive that's going to probably kick off in February or March. Okay. So we got to get them there soon. And we're totally out of time, but any chance Thank you'll you. run for one of the open Senate seats in Nebraska in 2024, Congressman? I don't think so. I think uh, we have Senator Fisher and Senator Ricketts now, and they're both uh, my very good friends. Okay. Congressman Bacon, thank you so much for covering such a wide range of topics with us today. We really appreciate it.
Coming up, tragedy upon tragedy. That was Governor Newsom's reaction to the back-to-back -back mass shootings in California that together, together killed at least 18 people. Plus a major development in the war in Ukraine as the U.S. prepares to send American-made tanks to the front lines of the fight. You're watching Meet the Press now. Welcome back. For the second time in three days, the California community is dealing with the aftermath of a deadly mass shooting. This time, it was the Northern California coastal town of Half Moon Bay, where police say a gunman killed seven people and seriously injured another yesterday at two agricultural businesses. Our NBC News station in the Bay Area captured this video of police arresting the suspect hours later. Investigators are calling the shooting a workplace violence incident. That deadly incident came less than 48 hours after a gunman opened fire at a dance hall in Monterey Park, California, killing 11 people who were celebrating the Lunar New Year. NBC's Jake Ward joins me now from Half Moon Bay, California. Jake, thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. We really appreciate it. Uh, what is the very latest on the investigation there? Well, Kristen, authorities at this hour have laid out the facts like this. Yesterday afternoon, uh, according to them, 67-year-old, it's not clear if he's 66 or 67, but we believe late 60s, Chun Li Zhao, an employee here at the Mountain Mushroom Farm, came here first, went into his workplace and killed four people and gravely injured a fifth, then drove himself a mile from here to another location where he killed three more people before then driving driving to the sheriff's substation where you saw in that dramatic video him being brought to the ground by sheriff's deputies. Uh, we do not know the motive at this time. It seems that he and the victims were co-workers, but we're not sure about that yet. Uh, and it is not yet clear exactly why he would have done this. We do know, according to the San Francisco Chronicle, that he has had restraining orders put on him by a co-worker in the past. So there is some pattern of that. But authorities here say they really have no idea why he would have done that. They, he had a legally owned semi-automatic semi -automatic handgun, but otherwise it was not clear. Those are the facts. The emotions, however, Kristen, are very, very plain. This is a very small community, about 11,000 people. And as I stand here, I'm smelling the smell of agriculture, of manure, of farming on the one side of me, and the ocean on the other side. This is literally a paradise. You come here, as I do with my family, to go to the pumpkin patch, to go to the beach, to go surfing, all of those things. This has never happened before in the history of this county, according to the district attorney, and that is part of what makes this such a horrific event in this tiny coastal community, Kristen. It truly is such a tragedy, Jake. Thank you for your reporting. Please continue to keep us updated. We do appreciate it. Joining me now is Monterey Park Mayor Henry Lowe. Mayor Lowe, thank you for joining us. My condolences to you and your community. Thank you. Thank you so very much for your condolences and for inviting us to your show. Well, we really appreciate your being here. I want to start off by just asking you how your community is doing, how you all are holding up. Thank you. Well, I think that right now in Monterey Park, um, our community, which is a very close-knit, tight community, there is uh, just emotions that run the gamut from disbelief to shock to anger and sadness about why this happened in Monterey Park. You know, unfortunately, I think far too often, when you read or hear about these instances, you think it only happens elsewhere, but now Monterey Park joins a list of 38 uh, mass shooting events in the United States, and it's not even the end of January yet. The, the numbers are just staggering and devastating, and I do want to ask you about the investigation, but first, I want to ask you about the lives lost, Mayor. Are there plans to honor the victims of this mass shooting? Yes. Uh, tonight, the city is holding a vigil at 5, 3 p.m. Uh, in front of our city hall. Um, we also have a memorial set up in city hall uh, uh, for people to place uh, flowers and candles. In addition, a memorial has been set up in front of the uh, dance studio uh, where the violent incident had occurred. Mm. And members of the community have been also holding vigils as well. Uh, there's also the community GoFundMe site that has been set up. Um, and people have just uh, been so generous in wanting to make sure that we face this crisis tragedy not alone, but as um, but with the support of everyone in this country. 
Well, I know that those community gatherings are going to be so important as you all grieve. I do want to ask you about the investigation. Can you give us the very latest that you are learning? And, and what more do you know about the suspect or any potential motive here? Yes. You know, the investigation continues. And unfortunately, we may never know fully what was the motive um, behind this. Um, what I do understand, what I do um, uh, know is that uh, the, the the gunman, uh, he had a history of, attend, uh, in the past, uh, going to his uh, dance hall, um, a, da a ballroom dancing is actually very popular in communities like ours in Monterey Park. And I, I also understand that uh, he met his ex-wife there. Um, mm -hmm. uh, but again, uh, who knows what is the connection? Um, uh, because uh, the, the violent act that happened during Lunar New Year Eve um, during the celebration, which, you know, our city just held its Lunar New Year uh, festival uh, ceremony kickoff earlier that day. And, uh, you know, we just may, may never know um, what prompted him to uh, commit such a violent and heinous act. Yeah. You know, Governor Gavin Newsom said that the Second Amendment is becoming, quote, a suicide pact after Saturday night shooting. Do you agree with that characterization? You know, it, 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 uh, already uh, our community is just reeling from uh, just this trauma that occurred. And I understand that, um, uh, you know, initially when the news broke about um, the shooting, um, I think many in our community was afraid, was this an act of anti Asian violence because for the past three years, communities like Monterey Park have been just really and on edge uh, mm. because of, of uh, xenophobia and racism directed at uh, Asian Americans. Uh, but, you know, I, I, as we're all trying to process all, all what has occurred in our community, uh, I, 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 you know, I was just saddened then to hear about what happened at uh, the city of Haboon Bay up mm. in Northern California. And, um, you know, my sympathies go to the city and that community because um, we know exactly what they're going through. Uh, but as, yeah, the governor said, it's tragedy upon tragedy upon tragedy. And the question, when is this going to stop? Uh, as I said earlier, I mean, there are now 38 incidents of mass shooting in the United States. And that's more than the month of January. Yeah, Mayor, to that point, let me just ask you a final question. California has some of the stiffest gun laws in the country. And yet, as you point out, the mass shooting in your area, the second mass shooting that you referenced has happened in recent days. What more do you want to see Congress do? What more do you think lawmakers can do to prevent these types of tragedies? Absolutely. You know, yes, California does have one of the strictest gun laws in the country. But one of the questions that we have as a community, besides what was the motive for the gunman, was, but also how did this gunman obtain what was an illegal firearm? Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it, 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 it doesn't matter if the state um, has stringent uh, uh, firearm regulation, but this is a national conversation we need to be having. And, and yes, we do look to Congress to act uh, because... I can't even imagine, again, 38 mass shooting incidents already, and we're not even into February yet. I can't even fathom the idea of how many we will count at the end of this year. Mm. It is an incredibly sobering and difficult thought. Again, our thoughts are with you and your community, Mayor Henry Lowe. Thank you so much for your time. We really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you. And up next, a Georgia judge weighs releasing a grand jury report on former President Trump's efforts to overturn the 2020 election. You're watching Meet the Press now. Welcome back. A judge in Fulton County, Georgia, heard arguments today on whether to publicly release the final report of the special purpose grand jury tasked with investigating former President Trump and his allies' attempts to interfere in the 2020 election. The special grand jury heard testimony from more than 75 witnesses, including sitting lawmakers, before issuing a final report earlier this month. Fulton County District Attorney Fannie Willis, who initially called for the grand jury, argued against the release of the grand jury's findings, saying it could undermine the rights of future defendants and that decisions on potential indictments from the investigation are, quote, imminent. NBC News correspondent Vaughn Hilliard has more on today's hearings. Vaughn, thanks so much for being with me on this. So 
What are the key arguments that the judge heard and what's the timing, the fact that we're hearing the word imminent? What do you make of that? Right, Kristen, there was a chance that we could have learned a heck of a lot here today about where this Fulton County investigation was headed. Because inside of this report that was completed by the special grand jury, inside of that report, we should expect to see recommendations for charges, potentially against Donald Trump, but also other allies here. Now, the district attorney, Fannie Willis, uh, she impaneled this special grand jury for the purpose of investigating the alleged efforts by Donald Trump and others to overturn the 2020 election in the state of Georgia. The special grand jury was impaneled because the special grand jury had subpoena rights. And we found out today that there were 73 witnesses that went before the special grand jury. So in the side of this report, not only would we see the recommended charges that the special grand jurors uh, uh, recommend that Fannie Willis uh, uh, proceed and try to bring charges on, but also the underlying evidence here. And so what the judge heard today was the district attorney making the case that it should not be public because they are still continuing her investigation and she has yet to bring uh, those charges uh, against Trump or other allies. But then you heard from multiple news organizations that made the case that it is in the public interest to make this report public now. But you said it. Fonnie Willis today said that decisions are imminent, which means that could be days, weeks uh, until she were to try to bring before a an additional grand jury, those charges and those intended indictments, Kristen. Okay. One of the many investigations swirling around the former president, Vaughn Hilliard, thank you so much for breaking all of that down for us. We appreciate it. After the break, the intensifying political fallout over classified documents as more sensitive material is discovered, this time in former Vice President Mike Pence's Indiana home. You're watching Meet the Press now. Welcome back. Both President Biden and former Vice President Mike Pence were eager to criticize their opposition for mishandling classified information before it turned out they both had classified material in their personal homes. Take a listen. How that could possibly happen, how one, anyone could be that irresponsible. And I thought, what data was in there that may compromise sources and methods? As a former Vice President of the United States, I... I can, uh, I can speak from personal experience about the attention uh, that ought to be paid to those materials when you're in office uh, and after you leave office. And clearly, uh, that did not take place in this case. Today's news that former Vice President Pence also had documents marked classified at his home doesn't just complicate political finger pointing. It also further exacerbates the serious questions about the security of the nation's classified information. To discuss all of this, I'm joined by my great panel, USA Today Washington Bureau Chief Susan Page, Democratic pollster Margie O'Mara, and former Republican Congressman from Florida, Carlos Curbelo. He is also an NBC News political analyst. Thanks to all of you for being here on what turned into a very busy news day. Susan, I want to start with you. I just interviewed Congressman Don Bacon. He said that this is an epidemic of mishandling yeah. classified material. You heard a lot of outrage on Capitol Hill about this. That's, that's right. I would like to say I have no classified documents. In my <laughs> uh, but apparently a lot of people do. And maybe we don't know about it. Maybe spies know about it. You're one I of mean, the few who does it. Yeah, apparently. I mean, it seems like it's a it seems like a problem. Yeah. Uh, and and it, se it seems like that's something we need to address in a kind of not partisan way, a national security way, although there's a big political element to this as well. There certainly is. Uh, Margie, talk about the political element, because here you have President Biden, who's been dealing with his own firestorm surrounding this revelation after revelation, drip, 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 and criticism that they haven't been transparent, and they've been trying to really um, stop the bleeding as it relates to that. Does this help the Biden administration try to pivot to other topics? Well, I think it re resets how we think about this, not about documents, are they good or bad to have in the House, well, but whether, and I should say, looking at my desk, I am no expert in document management, for sure, <laughs> but um, but how do you handle it once they're found? And in that regard, obviously the Pence situation just happened, but in that regard, Pence seems more like Biden than like Trump, which means, are we thinking about this of, you know, it's no big deal, which is what you heard Republicans saying with Trump immediately, to then say, well, maybe it is a big deal, to now are they back saying, it's not a big deal. Really, we should be thinking 
about how does one handle this? Does one handle this in a forthright manner and cooperate, or does one handle it in sort of a bombastic Trump way? And I think that's really what the conversation should be. Carlos, you do see this very firm distinction between President Biden, former Vice President Pence, and the way that former President Trump responded to having classified documents. What do you make of that distinction? Do you think it gets lost in the headlines of it? I think, unfortunately, it does, because fundamentally now this has become about the scandal of how classified documents are mishandled in our country. This is the most powerful country in the world, the country, I think, with the most powerful intelligence services, and we have all these documents just flying around <laughs> everywhere. So I actually think, Susan, I agree with you, I think this is somewhere where Congress might work together, because mm. for members of Congress, this is shocking. This is probably one of the few things that Congress does better than others. When you go to review uh, classified documents in Congress, there's a skiff. You go in. You can't take anything in. You can't take anything out. And really, that's how it should be. It's really dumbfounding uh, uh, to see all of these documents just sitting in people's homes. So, look, <laughs> I think that for uh, Joe Biden, today's a good day because it, he kind of gets the effect of, you know, everybody's doing it. You know, that, that, that <laughs> effect. And for Donald Trump, it's probably a good day, too, because he enjoys any day that's a bad day for Mike Pence and for Joe Biden. It, well, it's a great day for Donald Trump <laughs> uh, because it makes it, I think, very difficult to pursue mm. legal action against him for his own treatment of secret, secret documents that was really much different than the other two officials. I think it gets him off the hook. It gets him off the hook politically. It may even get him off the hook legally. I think it, it's an important point because what you start to see if you are the public sitting at home are a whole lot of headlines about classified documents. I was surprised. I asked Congressman Bacon, should there be a third special counsel? And Margie, he said, yes, there should be. I thought I was going to have to press him and do all of these follow-ups. <laughs> he said, yeah, there should be. I mean, do you think that, what would the impact of that be in this broader moment. You, I, you know, I don't know to what extent voters are going to be looking to see what body is going to be investigating this. That's ultimately not what voters are thinking about when they think about what's happening out of Washington. They want to see that people are cooperating and doing the right thing. And, you know, and, and that means cooperating. And whether that means special counsel is not really something that voters are going to be thinking about. Ultimately, they just want to see people being treated fairly and documents belong, going back to where they belong. And I go back to where we started this segment, which is that you have former Vice President Pence and President Biden with this initially kind of high and mighty approach to classified documents, Carlos. I mean, how much does that hurt uh, Pence's credibility if he does want to get into the 2024 race? It really does, certainly, at least in perception. And of course, we have to say right. every time there are differences between the cases, Donald Trump knowingly yes. kept these documents. He knowingly refused to return these documents. So there are differences. But on the surface, it certainly creates that equivalency. And that is bad for American institutions. It's good for Donald Trump. And look, we'll see how Merrick Garland handles this. I think that's a big question mark because we know that Garland is intent on protecting the integrity of the Justice Department. So I really wouldn't be shocked if he appointed a third special counsel just to prove to the American people that he's going to be even handed about the way he handles all of this. Let's move on to the debt ceiling. We know, Susan, that President Biden meeting with Democratic leaders today, he said we're not going to negotiate when it comes to the debt limit. We, this is something we have to do. We have to pay off the nation's credit card bill. Essentially, let's deal with um, spending cuts separately. But you have a lot of Republicans who are saying he's got to come to the negotiating table. Where do you see the middle ground? Do you think they're going to wind up negotiating? I, I do. I mean, th like Margie said, what people want to see with the uh, documents is that you're cooperating. Mm. What people want to see with the debt ceiling is that you're talking to each other. You're trying to come reach some common ground that works. And I thought uh, your interview with uh, Congressman Bacon was interesting because that's that's what he talked about. He wasn't making outrageous demands. He was just saying, if you want Republicans to move in your direction on this, you've got to do something, too. And of course, you don't want to. I know presidents don't like to negotiate on the debt ceiling, but they have in the past. We've done things like suspend the debt ceiling rather than mm -hmm. raise it or, or agree to a commission to study spending instead of just raising the debt ceiling. So there are things that could try to negotiate some middle ground that enables the debt ceiling to be raised. But Carlos, it, it, you it, it's hard to find anyone who can nail down the specifics 
politics of it. It, it is true. Congressman Bacon was very realistic about it, saying, look, we're not going to get the whole store, right. but there are some areas of potential bipartisan agreement, and yet no one has come forward to say, here's the spending cut that I want Well, and eventually that conversation will have to begin, especially because Senate Republicans are not going to engage. I think Mitch McConnell has concluded that he has nothing to gain by bailing out Democrats, by trying to negotiate a compromise, so he is going to leave it to Kevin McCarthy and Joe Biden to figure this out, and that means that at some point they're at least going to have to fake a negotiation, get together and have a dialogue. And, and that gets very tricky for the president. A lot of the sources I spoke to over the weekend said, how can Leader McCarthy, how can House Speaker McCarthy guarantee a deal when he has such a fractious caucus? Right. I mean, he was barely able to get elected speaker. Look, people, of course, want to see negotiation and want to see people working together. But what Republicans want to do, they want to hold the economy hostage in order to force cuts to things that people don't want to see cut, like Social Security and Medicare. There's a reason they're not out there saying, here are the things we want to cut. Let's come to the negotiating table so we can talk about cuts to Social Security and Medicare, because that's not what people support. And people are worried about the impact of um, of this coming to a, you know, coming to a crisis and what that's going to mean in terms of their own payments, their own benefits. Those are the things that people are really, truly worried about. Well, Nancy May said on Meet the Press Sunday that all that Social Security and Medicare was off the table. Mm -hmm. But I remind people, Kristen, we've been here before. Yeah. John ben Boehner negotiated a grand bargain with President right. Obama, and he could not get, to your point, House Republicans to back that agreement, an agreement that would have significantly cut government spending. So the point you raise, what are House Republicans going to accept, if anything, I think that's the important question. We have about 30 seconds. Susan, we've seen these debt ceiling fights before. Is this different? Is this moment different? Do we go I, over I the think cliff? This could, we could go off the cliff with this one because I think it is so hard to imagine Kevin McCarthy being able to bring his, a majority of his caucus to the table for doing something that's acceptable to the White House. What else is he going to have to <laughs> give up in order to get, get agreement? Well, that's the question, and it'll be down to the wire, as it always is. Thank you for a great conversation, Susan, Margie, and Carlos. Appreciate it. In just a moment, my one-on-one -on -one interview with National Security Coordinator John Kirby as the White House prepares to announce a major escalation in the war in Ukraine by sending U.S. tanks to the front line. Don't go anywhere. You're watching Meet the Press now. Welcome back. The U.S. and Germany's stalemate over sending tanks to Ukraine may soon be over. For weeks, Berlin has refused to send German manufactured tanks to Ukraine until the U.S. also agrees to provide Ukraine with American-made battle tanks. Multiple senior defense officials now tell NBC News that the Biden administration has decided to send dozens of those Abrams tanks to Ukraine. An announcement from the White House could come as early as tomorrow. For more, I am joined by NSC Strategic Communications Coordinator John Kirby. John, thanks so much for joining me. Really appreciate it. You bet. Glad to be here. Before we get to Ukraine, I want to get to the breaking news of the day, the fact that classified material was found at the home of former Vice President Mike Pence. I want, I'm wondering, John, if the NSC within this context has been reminded of proper procedures for handling classified material. Well, the national security staff and everybody on it, uh, we, we, uh, we take that seriously every single day. We don't need reminders to know that uh, the proper treatment of classified material is something that uh, you know that we all we all have to abide by uh, every single day that uh, that you come into work. Uh, you really can't do the job here without having access to, to classified information. And, uh, and again, we, we all take that very seriously. Okay, let me ask you about Ukraine. This reporting by NBC News, uh, our Courtney QB has confirmed that the administration has made the decision to send Abrams tanks to Ukraine. Can you confirm that on the record? No, I'm afraid I'm not able to confirm all the reporting out there. Well, look, we've, we've seen that, of course, throughout the, the course of the day. What, what I would tell you is that we have stayed in lockstep with the Ukrainians in terms of talking about the kinds of capabilities they need uh, in the fight in the near term, which is in the Donbass, open terrain, armored capabilities, clearly important, but also in the long term, in terms of what their longer term defense needs are going to be. We don't know how long this war is going to last, and we want to make sure that Ukraine is able to defend itself uh, for the long haul. So we are constantly talking to them uh, about those capabilities capabilities, armored capabilities, whether it's Bradley's or as President Zelensky has made clear, tanks are certainly part of those discussions, but I just don't want to get ahead of where we are. Can you characterize the current thinking? Are you leaning in that direction towards sending more tanks? What we are always leaning in the direction of is making sure that we are doing what we can in concert with allies and partners to
to make sure that Ukraine can defend itself against the threats it faces today, as well as where this war might be, you know, in weeks and months to come. And those discussions are iterative. We have them every day. Secretary Austin was just in Ramstein last week meeting with 50 nations about security contributions to Ukraine. Uh, so that's what we're leaning in on. We're leaning in on making sure that Ukraine can defend itself. One of the concerns that had been discussed as it relates to Abrams tanks is that they would be difficult to potentially train the Ukrainians to use. Is that still a key concern? Uh, any with any system that you're going to give uh, Ukraine in this fight, we, we have to be concerned about uh, the ability for them to be, train on it, use it, operate it, maintain it, repair it um, in, a, in a war zone. I mean, this isn't just peacetime. This is wartime for the Ukrainians. And so every time we give and contribute an advanced system, we have to factor that all in. And yes, it's absolutely a fact that the Abrams tank's the most uh, powerful one in the world, uh, but it's also very, very sophisticated. It has a, a, its own supply chain that would have to be minded. There's maintenance requirements that are different than on other tanks. And the Ukrainians aren't trained on how to fight uh, in the Abrams tanks. That's not to say that they can't be trained or that they can't learn it. It's just you have to factor all that in when you're talking about systems that you will or will no, not give another country. And uh, it's our understanding there are reports that that Germany is poised to send tanks to Ukraine. I believe NBC News has not yet confirmed that. But what are you hearing? Do you anticipate that Germany will be sending these tanks to Ukraine? This has been an active discussion, this issue of tanks. It's been an active discussion with our allies and Understood, partners. Understood, but, but has Germany us. made a decision? Are you aware well, of whether Germany's made a decision? I certainly will not speak for Germany in this. What I can tell you is that all of us as allies and partners trying to support Ukraine are talking about a range of capabilities that we know Ukrainians need, whether it's air defense or ammunition, certainly artillery, and now in this case, armored capability. And those conversations are ongoing. I certainly wouldn't speak for another ally. Uh, that's for them. Those are sovereign decisions that they get to make. All I can tell you is that we are interested in continuing to have these conversations. John, when might we hear from President Biden about this? Could we hear from him as soon as tomorrow or by the end of the week? Uh, I won't get ahead of, of, of decisions here one way or the other, uh, Kristen. So I certainly wouldn't be able to get ahead of, of uh, you know, of any potential announcements. We're having these discussions with our allies and partners. We want to make sure Ukraine can defend itself uh, and can succeed on the battlefield. And that requires really having an honest conversation about the capabilities that they need most. Help us to understand this moment, because based on my conversations, this is a critical moment. It is winter. These are the months yeah. when potentially Ukraine could make significant gains and that could potentially lead both sides to the negotiating table to try to negotiate a peace and end to this horrific war that has claimed so many lives. How does yeah. the administration view this period and what's the time frame for potentially helping that to happen? We all know that this is a critical point in the war. I mean, you've got winter, as you said, makes it hard to fight. Not impossible. There's fighting going on. But both uh, conditions in the air and the ground are not optimal for that. We also believe that Putin's going to take advantage of the winter to regroup, uh, reorganize, reman, and re-equip his forces uh, for potential offensive operations uh, come springtime. We want to make sure that the Ukrainians not only can defend themselves against the active threat they're facing in places like Bakhmut today, but that they also can prepare themselves uh, for fighting in the spring going forward and whatever their needs might be. In addition to all of that, you still have a significant air defense uh, threat over Ukraine as Putin continues to throw cruise missiles and Iranian drones at civilian targets and infrastructure trying to knock out the, the water and knock out the, the lights. So there's an awful lot going on right now in these crucial months. And we want to make sure that, again, we're setting Ukraine up for success here, not just now today, but in coming weeks and months going forward. Uh, John, uh, Last week at the podium, you outlined some concerning behavior by Wagner Group in uh, Ukraine. What is your expectation of any actions that may be taken? Can you outline any sanctions that we can expect to learn? I think you're going to hear more from the Treasury Department on, on uh, um, some uh, additional sanctions uh, uh, abilities here. I, again, I won't get ahead of them. I previewed a little bit of that last frame? week. Can you give us a I, time frame? I, I think, I think in the very, very soon uh, you're going to hear more from the Treasury Department on this. The, but the point is, and obviously we want to have economic levers and, uh, and more pressure put on Russia and on Wagner specifically, uh, this private military contractor. But again, we've got to, uh, I want to take a step back here and remember what Russia is doing here.
here. They are now throwing the bodies of, of convicts and prisoners that Mr. Prigozhin's getting out of jail, throwing them into the fight uh, in places like Bakhmut and, and Solodar. It speaks to the level of manpower concerns that the Russians have and their ability to, to, to field forces uh, in this fight uh, in Ukraine. And it speaks to the degree to which uh, Russia and Mr. Prigozhin are, are willing to to further corrupt themselves uh, by looking for uh, for help in, in the most unlikely places. They're getting support from Iran. Um, and as I detailed last week, Prigozhin is getting support personally for his contracting group, Wagner, from countries like North Korea. All right. John Kirby, thank you so much for joining us on a really critical day with a lot of information coming from Ukraine. We really appreciate it. Yes, and thank you for being with us this hour. Chuck is back with more Meet the Press Now tomorrow. NBC News Now coverage continues with Hallie Jackson right now. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.